Mosey friends. Welcome to Virtual Mosey, again here at Mosey. My name is Ermila, and we are celebrating Earth Week this week. I hope you're celebrating with us, um, and if you would like, you can post and comment about how you're celebrating, also where you're from. We'd love to know that. If you have any questions throughout our program today, feel free to comment those as well. I'd be happy to answer um, during our activity today. Speaking of our activity, we are going to be doing a flower dissection today. I have some of my flowers here. Um, after we do our flower dissection, we'll see how we can turn that uh, science into some artwork, and then we'll also talk about some other nature-inspired artwork for Earth Day or Earth Week. Um, so let's get started. Um, I have some flowers here that are pretty easy to dissect, and I got them at the grocery store. If you have um, flowering plants at home in your backyard or inside your house, feel free to use those. If you're gonna take a walk through your neighborhood for some flowers, um, you can pick up some that have already fallen off. You don't wanna pick them off a tree or a plant. Um, so um, this one is called Alstromeria. It's a little smaller, but it's really easy to get. And once you get them, they last a really long time in a vase. So I definitely recommend using these. Uh, we're going to be using this one today. This one is a lily, and it's much bigger, so it's a little bit better to do a dissection. So before we get into dissecting the flower, let's talk a little bit about why we do dissections. Dissections are really important to see each part of whatever you're dissecting, and you want to be able to really keep track of each part and observe each part really carefully so that you can see and guess at its purpose, right? So instead of just going all the way, we're just gonna do it step by step, really slowly, all right? So first, let's just look at our, our plant right here. So we have these. I'm sure most of you know what these are, right? They're leaves, and leaves contain chlorophyll, and that is how the plant creates its own energy from um, the sunlight. So those are really important. Um, this is the stem, and the stem would be connected to the roots, which go into the ground. We can't see those on here, but the roots are how we're gonna get water and nutrients from the ground. Some plants even have air roots, so they get the water and nutrients right from the air. So we're going to move up to the top of our flower here, and this is the one that we're gonna be dissecting today. So I'm just gonna snip that off. So we're just gonna look at this part right here. Um, as far as tools you need for dissecting, you can use scissors if you have them. If you have tweezers, you can use those. But these tools right here, your hands are probably gonna be the best tool. All right, so we have another leaf right here, so we're gonna take that off. And I'm gonna be saving all my parts right here on this sheet of paper for us to use later. Um, we're also gonna save this, which is part of the stem. So I'll actually use scissors to snip that off. All right, so if we look around here, we'll see some things that look like petals, but they actually have a lot of green on them. The outer layer is um, called the sepal, or they're called sepals. And while the flower is a bud, the sepals help protect the inside. So I'll bring another one over here. So you can see there's much more green. Those outer ones are sepals. All right, so let's take those off. I'm gonna place them down here on my sheet of paper. So this particular flower looks like it has three. All right, so as we go inward, these other ones that are still in there, those are the petals. And the petals have a really important job. You might notice if you observe some petals very carefully from different flowers, that they're all different colors, all different shapes, um, all different fragrances. Sometimes there's patterns on them. So these attract pollinators like bees, mosquitoes, butterflies, hummingbirds. And that's really important for that plant to make more plants. Um, so the petals have a really important job. They're almost, some flowers even kind of have patterns pointing right to the center. So they're almost like road signs for, for bugs and pollinators. All right, so we're gonna take our petals off. 
And we're gonna, I'm gonna put them in order. So we have our stem, our leaf, our sepals, and then our petals are gonna be right here. All right, and then we'll look at what we have left. Um, so we now have left the male part of the flower and the female part of the flower. So let's take a look at these parts first. One of these parts right here, this is called the stamen. This is the male part of the flower. And that is made of the filament, which is this tube, and the anther, which is at the top right there. And that is a really important part because that's where all the pollen is. Right, so we can, I can, I'm actually gonna leave these together and put it down here. And you'll notice most flowers have a whole bunch of these. So this one has one, two, three, four, five, and six. So as we take them off, you might notice um, that there's some dust flaking off of it. Sometimes that dust is brown, sometimes it's orange, sometimes it's yellow. This is all the pollen that's coming off. So if you're allergic, this is what um, is probably causing your allergy issues. All right, so what we now have left is the pistil, and this is the female part of the flower. Right, so at the very top of the pistil, this tube right here is called the style. And down here, this larger part is called the ovary. So that's where the ovules are. So during pollination, pollen from the anther needs to go to the ovary. So that is two genetic parts, the male part and the female part. When that gets together, then that flower can produce a fruit. That fruit will have seeds in it. Eventually that fruit will fall, those seeds might get buried in the ground, and that'll produce a new flower. So pollination is really important to um, flowers. So I'm going to show you guys the inside of this. So I can cut off the style, that down here. And if you actually very carefully with scissors kind of dissect this in half down the long way, hopefully you can see this, but you can definitely see it if you do it yourselves. Inside there, they're very, very tiny, but that mushy stuff inside there are the ovules. Yes, so flower, a flower can self-pollinate. Pollen from its own anther can go into its own style and produce um, a fruit. Um, but also, in nature, biodiversity is really important. So that's why pollinators are important, because we want um, pollen to go from one flower to a different flower. And that will produce more biodiversity, which is very important in preserving uh, species in nature. Great question. All right, so these are all the parts of my flower, all right? Um, like we said, we wanna be able to keep track of the parts of the flower just to help us remember, in case this is the first time you do it, um, you might forget what these parts are. So you can leave them like I have here and label them. Um, I have a diagram right up here with all of the parts that we talked about the stem, the sepal, the petals, the male part, which is the stamen, that has the anther on top with the pollen, and the filament on the bottom. And then on this side is the female part, the pistil, which is this whole thing, the ovary, and the style. All right, another fun way to do it is you can kind of arrange this back into the shape of a flower and then label it that way. So I've done that here. This is a different flower. It was a little bit smaller. So I just taped it and this will stay for about a week or so. 
So that'll help you remember the parts. Um, if you want to preserve it for even longer, you can take um, all of your parts and put them in some parchment paper. You want the paper to be absorbent, but try not to use paper towel because then your flowers will get the shape of whatever your paper towel has texture. And that texture will come out on your flower. So you can arrange it however you want. And I'll probably do it this way. Put these around. Right, and then you're gonna very carefully close it. And then you can find a really heavy book. I have this really old dictionary that I got for a dollar. I don't use book dictionaries anymore. I use online ones, so I don't need it anymore. I can place it in here. And that will take several weeks for all of the water to dry out. And then the flowers will be pressed flat. And then you can frame it or um, some people make them into earrings, whatever you want with it. Um, so that's a pretty fun way of preserving your science as art. Um, so talking about nature and art, there are a lot of artists that get inspired by nature and they um, try to record it in whatever art form they're using. So I'd like to talk about a few of my favorites today. This one has to talk about first, one, because if you look at the subject, it is the same flower that we dissected today. It's a lily. And also the artist is my mom. So I had to mention her. So if you notice that all of the botanical parts are there, the petals, the stamen, the pistil. So while she was painting the flower, I'm sure she learned a lot about the anatomy of the flower. And you can do that too. Okay, another one of my favorite artists is a Swedish artist. Her name is Hilma of Klint. And she's an abstract artist, but you might notice that there's a lot of botanical references in her paintings. So these look like the flowers that we just dissected. It's pretty cool. She's one of my favorites. This artist, his name is Charlie Harper. And he did, um, he was a conservationist. So he used a lot of geometric shapes to represent birds and animals that he saw in nature. So this is a woodpecker. This is an owl hiding amongst some trees. And then we have a beaver building a dam. So I like his stuff because he takes um, geometric shapes but also he kind of focuses in on one or two really identifiable characteristics of the bird and animal, and he emphasizes those. So with the beaver with its big tail and the teeth, and the owl with, it, with its eyes, and how it helps the owl camouflage amongst the trees, it's pretty cool. I like his stuff. And then this one, is an artist named Serena Supli, and she does a lot of paintings of the Grand Canyon. So this is actually the ranch at the bottom of the canyon. Uh, my brother sent me this photograph, this uh, postcard while he was at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. So that's pretty cool. And then this last one is kind of mixing nature and fantasy. And it also has my absolute favorite animal, which is the humpback whale. Um, and this was done by Leslie Peebles, who is a Florida artist. And she um, didn't paint it, it's actually a print. So she used a vinyl to carve that, those shapes out, and then she stamped them onto her canvas, which is pretty cool. So these are some of my favorite artists that use nature as inspiration. I hope you had fun um, with our flower dissection. I hope you get to try it and um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. We do have, Cynthia says hello. Hi, Cynthia. And Jose has asked, can some flowers glow under UV light? Ooh, that's interesting. Um, I believe some flowers do glow under UV light. It helps some insects that can see UV light um, or can perceive UV light find those flowers. 
Um, I don't know which ones because I don't have those kinds of eyes, but that would be a really fun experiment to try. If you have a black light at home, you can shine them on some um, flowers that you have and see if they glow under UV light. Great question. Cool. Well, thanks for joining me today, and I hope you celebrate Earth Week all week long and keep discovering.